taste of those things and those times. I've never regretted the unexpected left turn that dropped me in the restaurant business. And I've long believed that good food, good eating is all about risk. Whether we're talking about unpasteurized Stilton, raw oysters, or working for organized crime associates, food, for me, has always been an adventure. Food is good. My first indication that food was something other than a substance, one stuffed in one's face when hungry, like filling up at a gas station, came after fourth grade elementary school. It was on a family vacation to Europe, on the Queen Mary, in the cabin class dining room. There's a picture somewhere, my mother in her Jackie O sunglasses, my younger brother and I in our painfully cute cruise wear, boarding the big Cunard ocean liner, all of us excited about our first transatlantic voyage, our first trip to my father's ancestral homeland, France. It was the soup. It was cold. This was something of a discovery for a curious fourth grader whose entire experience of soup to this point had consisted of Campbell's cream of tomato and chicken noodle. I'd eaten in restaurants before, sure, but this was the first food I really noticed. It was the first food I enjoyed, and more important, remembered enjoying. I asked our patient British waiter what this delightfully cool, pasty liquid was. Vichy Soise came the reply. A word to this day, even though it's now a tired old warhorse of a menu selection and one I've prepared thousands of times, still has a magical ring to it. I remember everything about the experience. The way our waiter ladled it from a silver tureen into my bowl. The crunch of tiny chopped chives he spooned on as garnish. The rich, creamy taste of leek and potato. The pleasurable shock, the surprise that it was cold. I don't remember much else about the passage across the Atlantic. I saw Boeing Boeing with Jerry Lewis and Tony Curtis in the Queen's Movie Theater and a Bardot flick. The old liner shuddered and groaned and vibrated terribly the whole way. Barnacles on the hull was the official explanation. From New York to Cherbourg, it was like riding atop a giant lawnmower. My brother and I quickly became bored and spent much of our time in the teen lounge listening to House of the Rising Sun on the jukebox or watching the water slosh around like a contained tidal wave in the below-deck saltwater pool. But that cold soup stayed with me. It resonated, waking me up, making me aware of my tongue and in some way preparing me for future events. My second pre-epiphany and my long climb to chefdom also came during that first trip to France. After docking, my mother, brother, and I stayed with cousins in the small seaside town of Cabourg, a bleak, chilly resort area in Normandy on the English Channel. The sky was almost always cloudy, the water was inhospitably cold. All the neighborhood kids thought I knew Steve McQueen and Jack Lane personally. The Americans assumed we were all pals, hung out together on the range, riding horses and gunning down miscreants. So I enjoyed a certain celebrity right away. The beaches, while no good for swimming, were studded with old Nazi blockhouses and gun emplacements, many still bearing visible bullet scars and the scorch of flamethrowers. And there were tunnels under the dunes, all very cool for a little kid to explore. My little French friends were, I was astonished to find, allowed to have a cigarette on Sunday, which had been ordered van ordinaire at the dinner table. And best of all, they owned Velo Solex motorbikes. This was the way to raise kids, I recall thinking, unhappy that my mother did not agree. So for my first few weeks in France, I explored underground passageways looking for dead Nazis, played miniature golf, sneaked cigarettes, and read a lot of Tintin and Asterix comics. Scooted around on my friends' motorbikes and absorbed little life lessons from observations that, for instance, the family friend Monsieur Dupont brought his mistress to some meals and his wife to others. This extended brood of children apparently indifferent to the switch. I was largely unimpressed by the food. The butter tasted strangely cheesy to my underdeveloped palate. The milk, a staple, no, a mandatory ritual of 60s American kitty life, was undrinkable here. Lunch seemed always to consist of family chaux jambon or croque monsieur. Centuries of French cuisine had yet to make an impression. What I noticed about food, French style, was what they didn't have. After a few weeks of this, we took a night train to Paris, where we met up with my father in a spanking new Rover Sedan Mark III, our touring car. In Paris, we stayed at the Hotel Lutetia, then a large, slightly shabby old pile on Boulevard.
becoming a sullen, moody, difficult little bastard. I fought constantly with my brother, harped about everything, and was, in every possible way, a drag on my mother's glorious expedition. My parents did their best. They took us everywhere, from restaurant to restaurant, cringing, no doubt, every time we insisted on steak ache with ketchup and a They endured silently my Christ about cheesy butter, the seemingly endless amusement I took in advertisements for a popular soft drink at the time, sheet. I want shit, I want shit. They managed
o'clock when the two national stations would come on the air, my uncle Gustav would solemnly emerge from his room with a key chain to his hip and ceremoniously unlock the cabinet doors that covered the screen. My brother and I were happier. There was more to do. The beaches were warm, the closer in climate to what we knew back home. The added attraction of the ubiquitous Nazi blockhouse. There were lizards to hunt down and exterminate with readily available petar, firecrackers, and one could buy legally over the counter. There was a forest within walking distance where an actual hermit lived. My brother and I spent hours there spying on him in the underbrush. By now I could read and enjoy comic books and friends. And of course I was eating, really eating. Murky brown cheese, croissant, tomato salad, blue air, boulet dossier. We were only a few miles from the vast We made day trips to Castlereagh, a wild, deserted, and breathtaking and magnificent fantasy.
still happen. Scrubbing pots and pans, scraping plates and peeling mountains of potatoes, tearing the little beards off muscles, picking scallops and peeling skin, did not sound to look attractive to me. But it was from these humble beginnings that I began my strange climb to Shepherd. Taking that one job as dishwasher with the dreadnought eventually pushed me down the path I still walk to this day. The dreadnought was, will you be near something like this? A big old ramshackle driftwood pile built out over the water on ancient wooden pylons. In bad weather, the waves rolled under the dining room floor and thud loudly against the 
bridegroom, ushers, family, and friends. Married up Cape, the happy couple and party had come down to P-Town for the celebratory dinner following, presumably, a reception. They were high when they arrived. From the salad station at the other end of the line, I saw a brief, slurry exchange between Bobby and some of the guests. I noticed particularly the bride, who at one point leaned into the kitchen and inquired if any of us had any hash. When the party moved on to the dining room, I pretty much forgot about them. We banged out meals for a while, Lydia amusing us with her usual patter, Tommy dunking clams and shrimp in a hot grease, the usual ebb and flow of busy kitchen. Then the bride reappeared at the open Dutch door. She was blonde and good-looking in her virginal wedding white, and she spoke closely with the chef for a few seconds. Bobby suddenly grinned from ear to ear, the sunburned crow's feet at the corners of his eyes growing more pronounced. A few moments later, she was gone again. But Bobby, visibly trembling, suddenly said, Tony, watch my station, and promptly scooted out the back door. Ordinarily, this alone would have been a momentous event. To be allowed to work the busy broiler station, to take the helm, even for a few minutes, was a dream come true. But curiosity got the better of all of us remaining in the kitchen. We had to look. There was a fenced-off garbage stockade right outside the window by the dishwasher that concealed the stacked trash and cans of edible waste the restaurant sold to a pig farm up Cape from the cars in the parking lot. Soon, all of us, Tommy, Lydia, the new dishwasher, and I, were peering through the window where, in full view of his assembled crew, Bobby was noisily rear-ending the bride. She was bent obligingly over a 55-gallon drum, her gown hiked up over her hips. Bobby's apron was up, resting over her back as he pumped away furiously. The young woman's eyes rolled up into her head, mouth whispering, yes, yes, good, good. While her new groom and family chawed happily on their flounder fillets and deep-fried scallops just a few yards away in the dreadnought dining room, here was the blushing bride getting an impromptu send-off from a total stranger. And I knew then, dear reader, for the first time, I wanted to be a chef. Food is pain. I don't want you to think that everything up to this point was about fornication, free booze, and ready access to drugs. I should recall for you the delights of Portuguese squid stew, of well-fleet oysters on the half-shell, New England clam chowder, of greasy, wonderful, fire-red chorizo sausages, kale soup, and a night when the striped bass jumped right out of the water and on a Cape Cod's dinner tables. There was, in 1974, no culinary culture that I was aware of. In P-Town in particular, there were not, as there are today, any star chefs. School-trained, name-on-the-jacket characters, whose names and utterances were tossed around by foodies, photos swapped like baseball cards. There were no catchphrases like BAM and Let's Kick It Up a Notch bandied about on television for a credulous public like there are today. These were early times in American food. Squid was considered a garbage fish, practically given away at the docks. Tuna was sold mainly as cat food or to canneries and to a few enterprising Japanese who were thought to confuse things with the high prices they paid. Monkfish was yet to be called lot and make its appearance on Manhattan dinner tables. Most fish in P-Town was slapped boneless and skinless on a sizzle platters, drizzled with clarified butter and paprika, and then broiled to death. The parsley sprig and the lemon wedge were state-of-the-art garnishes. Our few culinary heroes at the Dreadnought were admired more for their studliness on the line, meaning number of dinners served each night, amount of pain and heat endured, total number of waitresses screwed, cocktails consumed without visible effect. These were stats we understood and appreciated. There was Jimmy Lester, the broiler king, whom we thought a lot of. He'd worked for years at a nearby steakhouse and was famous for the remarkable number of steaks and chops he could handle at one time on his big roll-out broiler. Jimmy had moves, meaning he spun and twirled and stabbed at meat with considerable style and grace for a 220-pound man. He was credited with coming up with the bump, a bit of business where a broiler man with both hands full of sizzle platters or plates knocks the grill back under the flames with his hip. We liked that. The mishandling of food and equipment with panache was always admired. To some extent, this remains true to this day. Butchers still slap down prime cuts with just a little more force and noise than necessary. Line cooks can't help putting a little English on outgoing plates, spinning them into the pass-through with reverse motion so they curl back just short of the edge. Oven doors in most kitchens have to be constantly tightened because of repeatedly being kicked closed by clog-shod feet, and all of us dearly love to play with knives. 
The boys across the street were considered to be a championship team, the perfect example of the culinary ideals of the time. Mario's restaurant was a hugely successful southern Italian joint, and the Mario crew were feared and respected because they did more covers by a few hundred each night than almost anyone else in town. It was fairly sophisticated stuff for the time. For the time. Whole legs of veal were actually butchered on the premises. Stocks were made from real bones, not commercial base. Sauces were made from scratch with quality ingredients. And the Mario crew were the loudest, crudest, most badass bunch of cookies in town. When they'd swing by the dreadnought for a few pops after work, they made our ragtag bunch of part-time roofers feel small. They were richer, more confident, moved with even more swagger and style than our motley crew of oddballs and amateurs. They moved in a pack with their own dialect, a high-pitched ultra-femme affected drawl, salted with terms from 18th century English literature and Marine Corps drill instructors speak a lush, intimidating, sardonic secret language, which was much imitated. You, sir, are a loathsome swine, too damn ignorant to pour piss from a boot. Your odor offends me, and my shell-like ear gapeth to hear thy screams of pain. I insist you avert your face and serve me a libation before I smite your sorry ass with the tip of my boot, you sniveling little cocksucker. They had women's... They had women's each other, a jarring thing to hear as they were all huge, ugly-looking, and wild-eyed with muscles and scars and door-knocker-sized earrings. They looked down on outsiders, frequently communicated with only a glance or a smile, and moved through the streets and bars and back alleys of P-Town like titans. They had more coke, better weed, bigger gold, prettier women, and they loved rubbing our noses in it. How many, they'd ask after a busy Saturday night. Oh, 150, 200, Bobby would reply, fluffing the number a little. We did what? How many was it, Dee Dee Dolan? The Mario chef would ask casually. 450? Five? Six, I think, Dimitri, the Mario pasta man would reply, a man who would later play a major part in my career. Yes, six. Slow night, I dare say. Pathetic, don't you know? Pig dogs must have eaten their mung elsewhere tonight. Dairy Queen, probably. Then there was Howard Mitchum. Howard was the sole name chef in town. Fifty-ish, furiously alcoholic and stone deaf, the result of a childhood accident with fireworks, Howard could be seen most nights after work holding up the fishermen's bars or lurching about town shouting incomprehensibly. He liked to sing as well. Though drunk most of the time and difficult to understand, Howard was a revered elder statesman of Cape Cod cookery, a respected chef of a very busy restaurant, and the author of two highly regarded cookbooks. The Provincetown Seafood Cookbook and Creole Gumbo and all that. Do you jazz. think this would be funny, just a practical joke, if you just wrote a suicide note for me and, and just blamed some random guy? <laughs> Do you think that would be? He had wild, unruly white hair, you know I mean? a gin blossom face, a boozer's gut. You know, like your and he barber wore the short or sleeve, something like that. Snap you know, you know. shirt of a dishwasher. Totally without you know, it was pretension, all Ralph but he is fascinating false. depositories of recipes, recollections, history, folklore, and Because you know the police would Strong be compelled to go to Abernathy's barbershop. And go, have you Howard ever heard of a fellow named Norm, Norm MacDonald? I go, yeah, he came in every couple of months for a trip. To do with it. Oh, okay. He loved well, the less anyways, popular fishes of the day. He took his life because tuna, of you. squid, mackerel, bluefish, and soft cod to great advantage. He wrote it here in this letter. The signature dish was haddock amandine. And people would drive for hours from Boston to sample it. He was the first chef I knew Ralph to appreciate fully to the local Portuguese cuisine. The spicy, cumin-scented squid stews, the linguisa-laden kale soup, the coupling of fish and pork joke. sausages. If you just and he was a strident advocate for the mystical powers of the guy. Quahog, that humble, that slightly a... tough local clown. You know what I mean? Once each summer, Howard and friends, you know, like mostly artists, local fishermen, like writers, and drunks, would throw a party called the John J. Gatsby you know, Memorial Clam Bake in honor falls. of a departed fisherman friend. It was a major social event for P-Town's year-round residents. You know, the police and for those of us to go to Abernathy's Barbershop and go, have you ever heard of a fellow named uh, Norm MacDonald? I go, yeah, he'd come in every couple of months for a trim. Oh, okay, well, anyways, he took his life because of you. Wrote it here in this letter. Would you like to keep the? And then Ralph Abernathy would have to spend the rest of his life walking down. 
Do you think this would be funny, just as a practical joke, if you just wrote a suicide note and just... You know what I mean? Because you know the police would be... Ever heard of a fellow named a Norm MacDonald? I go, yeah, he'd come in every couple of months for a trim. Oh, okay, well, anyways, he took his life because of you. wrote it here in this letter. Would you like to keep the... And then Ralph Abernathy would have to spend the rest of his life walking down. I suppose Tay is an important... It's a magical season for our little ones. But with the flu, RSV, and COVID all going around, everything you can to help them stay healthy. Keep this season magical by making sure hands are always washed, surfaces are regularly cleaned, and the whole family is caught up on their vaccines. Start by scheduling a COVID vaccine for your kid today at vaccinenm.org. today. Ok. Admettons que je change de prénom.
typiquement français, plus blanc. Ton projet c'est quoi C'est que je le devienne avec le temps Ah non, la couleur pour toi c'est pas un problème hein, parce que t'as une amie d'amis qui est plus noire qu'une arabe, excuse-moi. Okay. Si je change de prénom et que je suis asiatique, est-ce que ce sera plus facile pour toi à prononcer que Granerie Et si je change de prénom et que je déménage par contre, est-ce que je devrais rechanger de prénom Est-ce qu'il y a un prénom un peu passe-partout Tu sais, un prénom un peu agile qui esquiverait ton seum C'est quoi, je pense que même si je change de prénom et que j'ai un prénom plus français, toi tu sauras que j'ai changé de prénom et il y a forcément un moment dans la conversation où tu diras euh, euh, Mais c'est quoi ton vrai prénom et si je change de prénom, est-ce que tu vas choisir autre chose pour moi Ça, ça m'intéresse. Genre, est-ce que tu vas choisir comment je dois m'habiller Comment je dois pas m'habiller Si je suis une femme, comment je dois me déshabiller à la plage D'ailleurs, tu sais, c'est pas très bien vu en ce moment de trouver qu'une femme est trop habillée. Je dis ça pour toi. Ok, si je change de prénom, est-ce que tu veux changer d'autres mots qui sont pas assez français à ton goût Je veux dire, dans la vie de tous les jours. Tu sais Parce que dans la com, ça va être compliqué. Hein. Ouais, ils vont être perdus. Ils vont plus dire. Euh, euh, je t'envoie ça à Sap Ouais On se fait un call On se fait un call Mais why not Yes, on déj quand tu veux. Super. Ok, si je change de prénom, toi, qu'est-ce que tu changes Moi, je veux bien changer. Toi, qu'est-ce que tu changes Est-ce que tu vas te décoincer Est-ce que tu vas te détendre Parce que j'ai l'impression que t'as peur en fait. Tu sais, j'ai l'impression que t'as peur que ton monde change. Tu sais, t'as peur que je te change alors que tu veux me changer en premier. Que tu veux en fait. Tu sais, j'arrive pas à comprendre ce que tu veux parce que on dirait que tu veux que je change pour que je sois plus chez moi, mais quand je me sens plus chez moi, tu crois que je vais te grand remplacer Si je change de prénom, est-ce que je pourrais enfin arrêter de me justifier quand quelqu'un qui me ressemble fait quelque chose qui me ressemble pas Ou est-ce que du coup, parce que j'aurais changé de prénom, je devrais me justifier quand Nicolas ou Patrick dérape C'est comme. Euh, comme il dérape. Ah non, quand on a ce genre de prénom, c'est vrai, on n'a pas besoin. Ok, admettons. Est-ce que ça changerait quelque chose pour toi si l'équipe de France gagnait deux fois la Coupe du Monde avec des Français, avec des prénoms pas français Ouais. T'as vu, je suis du sarcasme, c'est français ça. Ok. Arrête, dis la vérité. Je suis né là, mais t'es toujours terrifié. Arrête, dis la vérité. Tu fais toujours l'étonné J'arrête, je dis la vérité Je le vis mal s'il faut dire la vérité Arrête, dis la vérité Parce que t'as une amie d'amis qui est plus noire qu'une arabe, excuse-moi. Okay. 
Si je change de prénom et que je suis asiatique, est-ce que ce sera plus facile pour toi à prononcer que Granerie Et si je change de prénom et que je déménage, par contre, est-ce que je devrais rechanger de prénom Est-ce qu'il y a un prénom un peu passe-partout Tu sais, un prénom un peu agile qui esquiverait ton seum c'est quoi je pense que même si je change de prénom et que j'ai un prénom plus français, toi tu sauras que j'ai changé de prénom et il y a forcément un moment dans la conversation où tu diras euh, euh, mais c'est quoi ton vrai prénom Et si je change de prénom, est-ce que tu vas choisir autre chose pour moi Ça ça m'intéresse. Genre euh, est-ce que tu vas choisir comment je dois m'habiller Comment je dois pas m'habiller Si je suis une femme, comment je dois me déshabiller à la plage D'ailleurs tu sais c'est pas très bien vu en ce moment de trouver qu'une femme et trop habillé, je dis ça pour toi. Ok, si je change de prénom, est-ce que tu veux changer d'autres mots qui sont pas assez français à ton goût Je veux dire dans la vie de tous les jours. Ouais, parce que dans la com ça va être compliqué. Hein. Ouais, ils vont être perdus. Ils pourront plus dire. Euh, euh, je t'envoie ça à SAP Ouais On se fait un call Ouais, on se fait un call Mais why not Yes, on déj quand tu veux. Super. Ok. Si je change de prénom, toi qu'est-ce que tu changes Moi je veux bien changer. Toi qu'est-ce que tu changes Est-ce que tu vas te décoincer Est-ce que tu vas te détendre J'ai l'impression que t'as peur en fait. J'ai l'impression que t'as peur que ton monde change. T'as peur que je te change alors que tu veux me changer en premier. Je sais pas ce que tu veux en fait. J'arrive pas à comprendre ce que tu veux parce que on dirait que tu veux que je change pour que je sois plus chez moi. Mais quand je me sens plus chez moi, tu crois que je vais te grand remplacer si je change de prénom, est-ce que je pourrais enfin arrêter de me justifier quand quelqu'un qui me ressemble fait quelque chose qui me ressemble pas Ou est-ce que du coup, parce que j'aurais changé de prénom, je devrais me justifier quand Nicolas ou Patrick dérapent Tu sais, comme, comme ils dérapent. Ah non, quand on a ce genre de prénom, c'est vrai, on n'a pas besoin. Ok, admettons. Est-ce que ça changerait quelque chose pour toi si l'équipe de France gagnait deux fois la Coupe du Monde avec des Français, avec des prénoms pas français Ouais, t'as vu, je fais du sarcasme, c'est français ça. Ok. Ah, dis la vérité. Tu n'es là, mais t'es toujours terrifié. Ah, dis la vérité. Tu sais que je suis là, tu fais toujours l'étonner. Jacques, je dis la vérité. C'est pas l'idée J'arrête
$10,000. If you are looking to get money for a good friend injury, I want you to imagine you and your family getting that money, because I know a way that you can. Now before you think I'm crazy, I want to show you how you can get the money that you are owed in the next 30 days. Now if you've thought about hiring an attorney before, but you didn't because you were unsure, or you had reservations, and it's not your fault, you were probably given no guidance and couldn't get a straight answer out of anyone about how much money you actually can make. I want you to capitalize on a limited opportunity that can have you cashing out a massive check in the next 30 days. This opportunity won't last long and it's perfect for anybody who's been in a car accident in the last two years. Do you still think it's impossible? I'm willing to guarantee that by clicking on the link below and filling out the 15 second quiz, you'll get a free case evaluation from one of the best attorneys in your area. As long as you are not currently working with an attorney, we're confident that our team will help you get the money you deserve in as little as the next 30 days. Still think it's too good to be true? Let me tell you about our client, Steven. Now, when Steven first came to us, he was really unsure if his case was going to be worth anything. He was facing a lot of uncertainties in his life, and he didn't know if he was going to get paid for his injury at all. Turns out, after filing a claim with us, he was able to take home over $100,000 in settlement from an accident that was over a year ago. It's possible, no matter what you thought in the past, you can get the money you were owed, and probably a lot more than you were expecting. Simply click the button below and answer the questions about your case. And if you qualify, an attorney from our team will lay out a game plan instantly and for free. The fact that you've been through this pain means you deserve to be compensated. Together, we're going to hold the parties responsible and get you the money that you are owed. You deserve more and we're willing to get you more. So what I want you to do is click the link below and fill out the 15 second quiz. And if after completion it says that you've qualified, it'll ask you for some additional contact details. And someone from our team will reach out and we'll lay out the fastest game plan for you to get the money that you are owed and get massive compensation for your injury. The YouTube video you were wanting to watch will always be there, but this opportunity and the resources behind it are limited. So, click the button below, begin the short process, and we'll... soon. Satanic mind of man. Anti-Illuminati John Steinbacher writes in his unpublished book this Novus Ordo Seclorum, The New Order of the Ages, Today in America, many otherwise talented people people are flirting this with disaster by associating with those same evil forces. Madame Blavatsky's doctrine was strikingly similar, similar to that, that of Weishaupt. The author also gives his, his version of the Birch's version of, of what the Illuminati are actually trying to accomplish. Their evil goal is to transcend materiality and to bring about one world denying the sovereignty of nations and the sanctity of private property. I don't think I can believe or even understand this, but at least it explains how both the Nazis and the communists can be pawns of the Illuminati. Or, or does it? Pat. Property is theft. Agbard said, passing the peace pipe. If the BIA 
helps those real estate developers take our land. Uncle John Feather said, That will be theft. But if we keep the land, that is certainly not theft. Night was falling in the Mohawk Reservation, but Hagbold saw Sam three arrows nod vigorously in the gloom of the... And they're actually blown away 100% of the time when they hear the answer. You see, when I was 19, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and the only options that my doctor gave me were pharmaceuticals and surgery. I remember the night that Chris got diagnosed with the brain tumor. I was in Virginia camping, and our dad unzipped my tent and said, we've got to go. Chris's life was in danger. We rushed down to Duke, and he was in a hospital bed. It was a very serious situation. Eventually, he was discharged from the hospital, but his life was still in danger. He had no testosterone, and his brain was in bad shape. We were all a bit up in arms when he told us he wasn't going on medication. I went a different direction, and I used strategic supplementation and other natural healing techniques to heal myself. At the time, I knew nothing about holistic health or the power of natural medicine. But every time I saw Chris after that day, he looked better. Over the years, he actually ended up looking and feeling way better than even before we knew about the tumor. I couldn't believe that he was able to solve something so serious with only natural practices. Micronutrients, diet, and lifestyle changes did the trick. When he decided to write a book on his journey, I had no idea it would turn into all of this. His story resonated with so many people who struggle with real issues and were looking for natural alternatives to pharmaceuticals, which were bringing so many harmful side effects along with them. That's when I knew he was doing something really, really important. So when he asked me if I wanted to drop my career in engineering to be a part of Umzu, I couldn't say no. I had seen the effects on Chris, and I had a hunch that we could really help a lot of people by educating and guiding down a natural path. You see, we never think twice when we have a problem. We go to the doctor, we take this and that medication, and deal with the necessary fallout. But besides a small group of people, humans aren't built for problems. We are very much products of our environments. The things we eat, the things we drink, the things we do, see, touch, and feel all affect our bodies either positively or negatively. Today, I'd argue that most things we consume aren't positives. What do you think that Easy Mac in your pantry will really do to your body? So that's what Umzu is. Umzu represents a level of awareness and self-care. And I'm not talking about going and getting a face mask on a Sunday. I'm talking about real self-maintenance. You need to give your body what it needs to thrive because we all deserve to thrive. And we all have the capability to do so by giving the body what it truly needs. Now, I've seen it work for so many people for so many real issues. Hormones, circulation, blood sugar, gut health, the energy. small cabin. All they needed was a little He felt again that American Vitamins, Indians were the herbs, hardest people in the world to understand. We are just too afraid to His tutors had given him a cosmopolitan education in every sense of the core. word. And he usually found no blocks in relating to people of any culture. But the Indians did puzzle at the time. After five years of specializing in handling the legal battles of various tribes against the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the land pirates, it served. He was still conscious that these people's heads were some place he couldn't yet reach. So the pressure is really on us to deliver for you. Either they were the simplest or the most sophisticated society on the planet. I want to hear next. Maybe. So if you want to learn more about Unzu, just click the link and read our whole story on the next page. The ultimate simplicity and the ultimate sophistication are identical. Property is liberty. Agbar said. I am quoting the, the same man who said property is theft. He also said property is impossible. I speak from the heart. I wish you to understand why I take this case. I wish you to understand in fullness. Sam Three Arrows drew on the pipe and raised his dark eyes. Ok. Admettons que je change de prénom. Du coup, est-ce que tu vas oublier que je suis moins clair que les autres prénoms Genre si j'ai un prénom plus euh, typiquement français, plus blanc, ton projet c'est quoi C'est que je le devienne avec le temps Ah non, la couleur pour toi c'est pas un problème, hein, parce que t'as une amie d'amis qui est plus noire qu'une arabe, excuse-moi. Ok. 
si je change de prénom et que je suis asiatique, est-ce que ce sera plus facile pour toi à prononcer que Granry Et si je change de prénom et que je déménage, par contre, est-ce que je devrais rechanger de prénom Est-ce qu'il y a un prénom un peu passe-partout, tu sais Un prénom un peu agile qui esquiverait ton seum C'est quoi, je pense que même si je change de prénom et que j'ai un prénom plus français, toi tu sauras que j'ai changé de prénom et il y a forcément un moment dans la conversation où tu diras euh, « euh, Mais c'est quoi ton vrai prénom ?» Et si je change de prénom, est-ce que tu vas choisir autre chose pour moi Ça, ça m'intéresse. Genre, est-ce que tu vas choisir comment je dois m'habiller Comment je dois pas m'habiller Si je suis une femme, comment je dois me déshabiller à la plage D'ailleurs, tu sais, c'est pas très bien vu en ce moment de trouver qu'une femme est trop habillée. Je dis ça pour toi. Ok, si je change de prénom, est-ce que tu veux changer d'autres mots qui sont pas assez français à ton goût Je veux dire, dans la vie de tous les jours. Tu sais, parce que dans la com, ça va être compliqué. Hein. Ouais, ils vont être perdus, ils pourront plus dire euh, euh, Je t'envoie ça à Sap Ouais On se fait un call Ouais, on se fait un call Mais why not Yes, on déj quand tu veux, mais super Ok, si je change de prénom, toi qu'est-ce que tu changes Moi je veux bien changer Toi qu'est-ce que tu changes Est-ce que tu vas te décoincer Est-ce que tu vas te détendre Parce que j'ai l'impression que t'as peur en fait Tu sais, j'ai l'impression que t'as peur que ton monde change Tu sais, t'as peur que je te change alors tu veux me changer en premier je sais pas ce que tu veux en fait. Tu sais, j'arrive pas à comprendre ce que tu veux parce que on dirait que tu veux que je change pour que je sois plus chez moi. Mais quand je me sens plus chez moi, tu crois que je vais te grand remplacer Si je change de prénom, est-ce que je pourrais enfin arrêter de me justifier quand quelqu'un qui me ressemble fait quelque chose qui me ressemble pas Ou est-ce que du coup, parce que je... Je devrais me justifier quand Nicolas ou Patrick dérape. C'est comme, euh, comme il dérape. Ah non, quand on a ce genre de prénom, c'est vrai, on n'a pas besoin. Ok, admettons. Est-ce que ça changerait quelque chose pour toi si l'équipe de France gagnait deux fois la Coupe du Monde avec des Français, avec des prénoms pas français Ouais T'as vu, je fais du sarcasme. J'ai fredonné. Il ah, y a le micro aussi. C'est dur de pas. Je dis, non, mais je m'excuse. Je, je, je vais partir. Je vais pas. Awkward.